Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. Please stand for our opening hymn number 328, God's Holy Ways Are Just and True.
Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and we welcome God's presence here in the sanctuary. As Christians, our declaration of faith is found in the words of the Apostles' Creed, words that have been recited by Christ's followers throughout the centuries. And today we join our hearts and our voices with the historical and global church as we declare our faith. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we'll continue to worship God with song and the giving of our tithes and offering. This morning, we have Rodari Simpson, who is the tenor section leader. He will be leading us in an African spiritual for our offertory worship. For those of you that are here in the sanctuary, offering plates will be passed through the pews. And for those of you worshiping from home, you can follow the instructions on the screen or visit our website at sandwichchurch.org. Let's continue to offer hearts of praise to the Lord Most High. in him are blessed all things are done by his will he spoke to the sea and the sea stood still now ain't that a witness for my lord ain't that a witness 
witness for my Lord. Ain't that a witness for my Lord? My soul is a witness for my Lord. Now there was a man of the Pharisees. His name was Nicodemus, but he didn't believe. The same came to Christ by night, wanted to be taught how to human sight. Nicodemus was a man desiring to know how a man could be born when he is old. Christ told Nicodemus as a friend, man, you must be born again. Said, marvel not men if you want to be wise. Repent, believe, and be baptized. Then you'll be a witness for my Lord. You'll be a witness for my Lord you'll be a witness for my Lord my soul is a witness for my Lord you read about Samson from his birth the strongest man that ever lived on earth way back yonder in ancient times he killed 10,000 of the Philistine then old Samson went wandering about Samson's strength was never found out Until his wife sat upon his knees She said, tell me where your strength lies If you please But Samson's wife, she talked so fair Samson said, cut off of my hair Shave my head just as clean as my hand And your strength will come like a natural man Oh, Samson was a wit for my Lord, Samson was a witness for my Lord, Samson was a witness for my Lord, my soul is a witness for my Lord, there's another witness, no there's another witness. soul is a witness for my Lord. Yeah. Please stand as we sing the doxology giving thanks to God and asking him to bless and multiply our gifts. Heavenly Father, we worship you with all that we are and all that we have. May the words of our mouth, the meditation of our hearts, and the giving of our tithes and offering be pleasing unto you. Please use and multiply these gifts for your kingdom and for your glory. We pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the announcements. Good morning, Stanwich Church family, and welcome to Sunday morning worship. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Pastor David, the pastor of evangelism and discipleship here, and we're so glad that you're here this morning. First, we invite all to coffee hour immediately after the service. You can find your way there by heading through the door in the front left side of the sanctuary. If you plan to join, we ask that you put on a name tag and you introduce yourself to someone new. Also, if it's your first time here with us, we'd like to get to know you better. And you can help us do that by filling out one of the Let's Get Acquainted cards in the pews in front of you. If you're seated on the balcony, you can find those cards in the back of the hymnals. Also, for those that are technologically advanced, you can scan a QR code on the back of the bulletin and upload your information that way. 
Pivot Ministries sends their heartfelt gratitude to Sandwich Church for all the food, needed grocery items, and Amazon wish list goods that were purchased on their behalf the few week, this, their behalf the past few weeks. The men of Pivot face incredible struggles as they seek Jesus in their recovery from alcohol and drug addiction. These gifts are very appreciated, and we gave such a great bounty. Individually, we can do so much, but this is a great reminder that together, God can use our church in a mighty way. Well done, church, and many thanks to all who stood with the men of Pivot and gave. This past week, the student ministry transformed Emmaus Hall into an elegant dining venue where 83 individuals enjoyed a decadent three-course meal, all in support of the students' upcoming mission to Appalachia. This evening was filled with joy and laughter and connection, and everyone that attended talked about how they felt the Holy Spirit being so present as the students served the meal. Come to find out later in the week, we found out why the evening was such a success. Tracy brought the kids from the kids' ministry into the sanctuary at the beginning of their time, and they prayed for their parents to have a good dinner. So cool, right? By the way, we here at Stanwich, we recognize that it takes a village to raise each kid in our church in the faith. And God is calling some of you to be a part of that village. If you want to become a kids ministry leader, Tracy wants you to know it only takes two requirements, very simple things. You have to love Jesus and love kids. God is calling some of you to serve, and we invite you to come alongside us in raising these kids in the faith. If you're interested, we ask you to uh, reach out to Ashley. Her email is ashley at sandwichchurch.org. Also, for those of you who are interested in going on the student mission this summer as a high schooler or as a volunteer, uh, you can look to our website at sandwichchurch.org for more information. This Wednesday marks the beginning of Lent. During Lent, historically, believers have set aside time each year for fasting and prayer to make the, an intentional focus on Christ's life, ministry, sacrifice, and resurrection. We begin the Lent this year with our Ash Wednesday service right here in the sanctuary this Wednesday at 7 p.m. In this service, we'll prepare our hearts for Lent, ashes will be distributed, and there will be nursery care available for those two years and under. Also during Lent, we encourage everyone to join a Lenten life group. The life groups will dive deeper into the scripture passages that we'll study each week. Life groups meet both in individuals' homes and online. And if you want to learn more about how to join a life group, you can pick up one of these booklets on the way out. These booklets have all the groups that are joining for the Lenten study. Also, these booklets have some theology about Lent and some ways you can really press in and get the most out of this coming Lenten season. As our church expands and grows, we need more individuals who are equipped to serve God through prayer. Next Sunday, we'll be offering a brief training session for our Sunday morning prayer teams. So if you've ever served on a Sunday morning prayer team in the past, or if you're interested in serving on a Sunday morning prayer team in the future, we invite you to the meeting room next Sunday after both the 9 a.m. and 10.45 a.m. worship services uh, to learn more about what that looks like. We know that God is stirring up new prayer warriors in our church that have a heart for intercession. And so we encourage you, if you feel called to this ministry, please join uh, that time of training on Sunday morning. If you want more information about that, you can contact Gina Hans, our Director of Spiritual Formation. Speaking of growth and expansion here at Stanwich, on Friday, Craig Pagnick and I headed to the Stanford campus because we were curious to see how construction was going. And as we stood in the new property, we couldn't help but feel anticipation for what the Holy Spirit has planned to do through our church in Stanford. We stood there and we looked out at that huge space, and I couldn't help but imagine the building filled with people worshiping Jesus. And I was filled with excitement and joy for what God has for us in Stanford. We ask that you please continue to pray for the project and pray for those construction workers even that are in the property each day preparing that church for God's glory. If you want to learn more about what's happening in Stanford, you can do so on our website at stanwichchurch.org. 
At this time, we have our dismissal, so please listen to these instructions. We have a comfort room downstairs that live streams the service should you need it. We have nursery care in the kids' wing for those two and under. Also, uh, at this time, kids pre-K through fifth grade can follow Miss Ashley up here in the front of the sanctuary, and students can follow Miss Lauren in the back, and adults, please stand and greet one another now with the peace of Christ. We've come to the time in our service where we make our requests known to the living God. We'll begin with a period of silence in which we allow the Holy Spirit to guide us to the names and situations in which he is calling us to intercede. Then after I pray, you'll have the opportunity to voice your requests aloud or in the silence of your hearts. So let us go before the living God in silence. Heavenly Father, you are our beacon of hope, our salvation when trouble is near. When the storms of life sweep us up, you guide us back safely to shore. Lord, we want to devote our lives to you and seek your goodness in everything. Lord, as we seek you, we can't help but look out on the beauty of your creation. And although we see its beauty, we also see its brokenness. So this morning, we take time to pray into some of these broken spaces. God, we pray now for the nations that are experiencing war. And Lord, we ask for your peace. Lord, would you bring peace to the people of Ukraine to the people of Syria, to Yemen, and to Afghanistan. Lord, we pray especially for the food crisis in Yemen. God, there are many people starving, people that you love. And so, Lord, we pray that you would free up the aid on the borders of that nation to get to those people in need. Lord, we also pray for Turkey and Syria nations that are recovering from recent earthquakes. Lord, would you draw near to those that are burying loved ones? Lord, would you draw near to those that have lost everything? And Lord, we pray for your church in Syria and Turkey. Lord, would you empower your people to serve and to be persons of peace in the midst of healing in the midst of tragedy. And Lord, we also look to our own nation. God, there's so much division and strife, and yet we still see that you are on the move. Lord, we thank you for this movement that we are witnessing in Wilmore, Kentucky at Asbury University. Lord, we thank you for how it's spreading throughout the nation. 
God, would you use this simple movement to bring many more people into your kingdom? And now, Lord, I ask that you hear the prayers of your people. (laughs) Heavenly Father, we thank you for how you hear our prayers. And now we pray for an anointing over the reading, hearing, and preaching of your word. We pray a double portion over Pastor Heather as she preaches today. And now, Jesus, we pray the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture will be read this morning by Claire Daplin. The Old Testament lesson for today is from Nehemiah, chapter 9, verses 9 through 17. This can be found on page 476 of your Pew Bible. After the reading of God's law, the Hebrews are led in a prayer of confession and repentance in which they recall the history of God's unfailing grace since the days of their forefathers. A reading from Nehemiah, chapter 9, beginning with the ninth verse. You saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and heard their cry at the Red Sea and performed signs and wonders against Pharaoh and all his servants and all the people of his land, for you knew that they acted arrogantly against our fathers. And you made a name for yourself, as it is to this day, and you divided the sea before them so that they went through the midst of the sea on dry land, and you cast their pursuers into the depths as a stone into mighty waters. By a pillar of cloud you led them in the day, and by a pillar of fire in the night to light for them the way in which they should go. You came down on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven and gave them right rules and true laws, good statutes and commandments, And you made known to them your holy Sabbath and commanded them commandments and statutes and a law by Moses your servant. You gave them bread from heaven for their hunger and brought water for them out of the rock for their thirst. And you told them to go in to possess the land that you had sworn to give them. But they and our fathers acted presumptuously and stiffened their neck and did not obey your commandments. They refused to obey and were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them, but they stiffened their neck and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. But you are a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and did not forsake them. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Thanks be to God. to reason. 
everyone in this room who's a parent, an aunt and uncle, a babysitter, or has ever been around a toddler, knows what happens when you go to a store like Michael's. It's a craft store, there's all these entertaining things on the shelf, and you're pushing your little angel in the grocery cart, in that little seat right there, but then something happens. That child starts to get hungry, angry, bored, or tired. And immediately, the child wants to get down from where they are. And you do your very best to distract and de redirect them, but it is to no avail. You start to realize they will explode if they are not set free. So your next tactic is to reluctantly put them on the ground, but instruct them that they have to push the cart with you and that will be the way they're allowed to stay down. So they're pushing the cart for about a half an aisle until the shiny objects start appearing at their eye level. And all of a sudden, they're grabbing one, two, ten of them. And despite your best negotiating skills, you're unable to prevent them from grabbing things. So you know what comes next. You're going to have to lift them back up and place them in the seat. Now, when this happens, as you attempt this, the child's face turns red, their body stiffens up, and their back arches. And you realize in midair that anatomically you are unable to insert them back into the seat. And as you're attempting to do so, their angry protest volume starts increasing dramatically, and you realize you have to surrender to defeat. You leave the cart and the store behind. <laughs> now, there might be a few toddlers in the Sandwich Church family that on occasion have acted in such a manner, but that's okay because I am sure that I was one of those toddlers as well. In fact, my parents belong to Sandwich Church, so you're welcome to check with them and <laughs> confirm this. But we might call this being strong-willed. But the Bible has another word for it. It is being stiff-necked. And our parents are not trying to harm us when they put some restraints on us. In fact, they're trying to help us to understand that not everything we want is good for us. But we are prone to rebel. We all have ways of trying to do a workaround, to position our hearts and our bodies, to resist doing what is right but what is ultimately for our good and to bless us. So today is our final sermon in Nehemiah in our Word series. And last week, you may remember Pastor Nathan described the people when they're hearing the law read, they were weeping and rejoicing. And they were so moved by it. But today we hear a little bit more about what happens in our relationship with God. Despite God's great work in the past, his people back then, and even us now, turn away from God. We are like that angry child. We stiffen our necks and still disobey God's word. So what is our way back to God? When we remember who God is and what he's done for us, and we turn back to him, God is always and ever ready to forgive us. Our reading for today is part of a beautiful and lengthy prayer in the Bible. In fact, it's the longest prayer in Nehemiah 9. It starts with praising God, who's from everlasting to everlasting. And the priests are calling out to the people with loud voices, saying, remember who God is and what he's done. Our text today starts with verse 9, and this is a prayer about God. You saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt, and you heard their cry at the Red Sea. I want to pause right there. You saw their affliction, and you heard their cries. Well, there may be a few of you here today that are feeling that suffering, and you're wondering if there's any hope for change at all. Maybe it's change for your family or change for our country or change for our nation. Well, here's the good news. God hears your suffering. He hears your affliction and he cares for your tears and your suffering. 
What we know in scripture is that because he saw and he heard, the prayer goes on to remind us what he does. He acts on behalf of his people. These returned exiles in Jerusalem are hearing about the defining moments for the people of God that happened a thousand years earlier, and that is called the Exodus. This is where God stirred up the heart of Pharaoh and went against Pharaoh and the Egyptians that were holding the people of God captive as slaves. And he did marvelous things to deliver them. He divided the sea so that people could go on it. He sustained them for 40 years out in the wilderness on their journey, and he was providing for them, reshaping them as his people. And when we agree to follow God, we too will see miracles. We are set free from things that hold us captive. And we experience his provision. And finally, he reshapes us into the people he's called us to be so that we could be the very best versions of ourselves. Let's look at how he guides them in the wilderness. In verse 12, we find him leading them. By a pillar of cloud, you led them in the day, and by a pillar of fire in the night, to light for them the way in which they should go. Now, cloud and fire were signs of God's presence, and we see that at the burning bush and up on Mount Sinai and in the tabernacle. Now, honestly, I am a little jealous of these people. You know, can you imagine where is God? Oh, right there. The cloud right there, the pillar of cloud. Or, oh, there, the pillar of fire that's lighting up the whole night sky. You know, I have asked God a number of times if he would just simply write the answers to my questions on a billboard so that I wouldn't miss it, that he'd make it really, really obvious. So I guess part of me would like to get to heaven and say, guys, you had the cloud of by day and the pillar of fire by night. How could you get it wrong? But you know what they'd probably say to me? Actually... You had it far better than we did because you had the Bible, the whole entire story, and you carried it around. In fact, today, if you look around, there are, about a, there are hundreds of these in the pews. We all have the full story of what God's done, what he's promised, and what awaits us right here in our hands. Some of us even have the Bible app on our phones so we, we are really blessed and privileged. We have more than the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. We have God's word. And in it, we learn what God has done for us, what he's promised, and most importantly, who he is. So today's reading also describes Moses coming down <clears throat> and God coming down first to Mount Sinai and giving these tablets of stone on which he's written his law to Moses, who then brings it to the people. And those things that were on that tablet we call the Ten Commandments, and they were instructions on how to live in harmony with God and with others, rather than being stiff-necked and rebellious. When we obey God's right rules, we experience supernatural peace and joy, no matter what we're going through. <clears throat> and they help us to know how to live that life that Jesus called the whole, the full, the abundant life. This prayer highlights as well the importance of the Sabbath. And the Sabbath is the day set aside to rest and to pause and to create space for God in our lives. Our work on the Sabbath is to not work. And as we do, we acknowledge that he is the one responsible for upholding the whole universe and that he is in charge, not us. God provided bread from heaven and water from uh, out of a rock. And this food came down from heaven, dropping down daily for them. They collected it and that was what fed them out in the wilderness. And Moses struck the rock with his staff and water poured out, gushed out of it to satisfy their thirst. Jesus prayed, and we all did just a few minutes ago, God, um, give us this day our daily bread. And what that tells us is that God cares about everything that's important to us, our big needs and our small ones, 
All of this matters. And what did all this leading and guiding and providing lead to? Well, it was the final part of what we read um, in verse 15, and that is take the land. He wanted them to be reshaped into his people to become a separate nation so that other nations could look to them and know God. That's part of something each one of us are being asked by God to do in our own lives. There's some arena in which God is saying to each one of us, take the land, possess the land. He says, live out your new identity as my people in the places that I take you. Now, after all these miracles of God's leading and reshaping all the work he did for his people, were they grateful and lived happily ever after with God? Unfortunately not. They did not. Bad news came next. Let's look at that at verse 16 through 17. But they and our fathers acted presumptuously and stiffened their neck and did not obey your commandments. They refused to obey and were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them. But they stiffened their neck and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. Now, acted presumptuously. There are a few other words for that that include the word arrogant, rebellion, and proud. So all of these things were part of what's going on. They were acting out. It can also even mean bubbling up. So they were bubbling up, ready to explode. And if we're really honest, we know that we still are like that little toddler refusing to get in the cart because we think we know what's best for us. Stiff-necked can also mean antagonistic, stubborn, and argumentative. And I hate to admit it, but I can still be stiff-necked towards God and towards others. But, um, you know, we do refuse God. However, even as stiff-necked people, one of the misconceptions we get into is that we think if we go back to Egypt, if we go back into slavery, we'll be better off than following God. That is not the case. But many of us continue to be slaves to sin, whether it's compulsive behaviors or actions, addictions, things that drag us down and control us. We know in our hearts that they're not what's best for us, but we give in to them. And the rest of this chapter goes on to describe how the people repent and then God forgives and then the people rebel once again in sin. And the cycle goes on and on. God forgives, they sin again, they repent. It keeps happening, this cycle of disobedience. Rebellion can lead us to bondage, but God is offering us freedom. Now you may say, why would God take us back when we keep sinning over and over again and not getting it right? Our answer is found in the second half of verse 17. Here's what it tells us. But you are a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and did not forsake them. God acts to save his people. That's what we heard about in the beginning. But now what we see is the reason he did that, and he does that for us, is because of his heart, because of his character. He won't abandon us. And I'm so grateful that God is a better forgiver than I am a sinner. His loving kindness is always available for us. I wonder if we all see God's face towards us that way. When I think of human faces that might have some of these qualities in my life, gracious, merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, I actually have a few faces that come to mind. My mother's mother, we used to call her Grammy Alice. She only lived till I was nine years old, so she passed away a long time ago, but she left a lasting impression on me. 
and I can still remember going to visit her and Bob Bill in their home in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And we would go, and she would open the oven and take out these warm chocolate chip cookies. And I can still smell the smell, and I can still taste them. And I remember splashing around in her pool, and the house was built all around the pool. But my favorite memory in that house was of curling up next to her and snuggling up, and we would read books for what felt like hours. And we had big, large dollhouse picture books, and we would point things out to each other and describe what we saw. She was a former editor at Doubleday in New York City, so beside her bedroom chair, there were huge stacks of books. And I think I got a love for books from her. She was a very special person, and um, I knew that she loved me more than I deserved. In fact, whenever we got to see each other, she was so excited for our visit. She was gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. The last memory I have of her was of being in her car, and she was in the front seat driving, and my mom was in the passenger seat, and I was in the back, right in the middle of the car, and I remember with love looking at her hand lying on the armrest between herself and my mom. And in that moment, I felt so full of joy. I felt so relaxed. I felt safe and perfectly at peace. And it makes me think about the fact that when we are right in that right place with God, when we let God drive the car and we sit in the back seat relaxing, then we don't have to worry about where we're going or what's up ahead or the rear view mirror what we've left behind because we know God's in control. He's got this. We're safe and we're fully loved. When we understand the depths of his character and how he feels about us, we can rest in that place. God wants us to come home to him. He wants to shower us with his mercy. Ultimately, he does something radical to break that sin cycle we talked about earlier. He proved his great love to us by sending his son Jesus to live among us and to point us to God and to take on himself all of our sin and our stiff-necked ways and to take it to the cross and to die for our full pardon and forgiveness and then to be resurrected again so that we might have new life both now and for eternity. Jesus is the fullness of God's love to us. This text for today tells us, remember what God has done and remember who he is. Remember his heart for us, most especially when we disobey, when we're being stiff-necked, that in the middle of all that, God says, I love you, I forgive you, he is eager, racing towards you to offer you his grace and mercy. He wants relationship with you and to give you a whole and a healed life so that out of a heart full of love, you can be all that he has destined you to be. And as you take the land in your own way, your life will reflect the light of Jesus and will draw others to him. We have a special opportunity this week to recommit ourselves to God. And if you're aware of your stiff neck or your need to get reconnected to God, come Wednesday night and receive ashes on your forehead for Ash Wednesday. It starts our season of the journey into Lent, and that's where we wander with Jesus to the cross and through the cross to resurrection morning. As you make space for God in your hearts this season, I hope Nehemiah 9, 17 is part of that for you. And I want to pray that over us as we close. God, you are ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. You will not abandon us or forsake us no matter what. We are so grateful for how much you love us, 
Help us to follow Jesus as his disciples, to watch how he works and to do as he's done so that your Holy Spirit working in us can help us to share his good news to a world in need. All for your glory. Amen. Please stand for our communion hymn. Please be seated. Well, it's not a very flattering image to think of yourself as an arched back toddler, <laughs> but according to God's word, that is us when we fail to obey his word. Even those of us who maybe keep our lives clean from sort of the obvious sins, we too are that stiff-necked rebel if we don't follow God's call into loving and sacrificially serving those in our lives. One way or the other, we fail to respond fully to God's word. We're going to make confession here in just a moment as we come to the table, acknowledging our stiff necks. But as we go to the table to meet Jesus there, it's not just that we confess that about ourselves. It's also that we recognize that there's been one person in human history who did not stiffen his neck, who did not arch his back in rebellion against the very difficult call that God the Father placed on his life. Jesus. It's easy to forget this, but he could have said no. When God the Father said, go to the cross and bear the sins of all those stiff-necked people, Jesus too could have stiffened his neck. He could have said no. He could have said, it's too hard. It's too painful. But instead, he went. He went to the cross. And I want us, just for a moment, as we go to meet him at his table, I want us to take a moment and behold him there upon the cross. In our mind's eye, let's behold Jesus on the cross. And he had the very opposite of a stiff neck. In fact, when I look at his head bowed in death, I realize that he's the one person in history who actually fulfilled the word of God to sacrificially love. And Jesus died there. And his neck hung limp in death. He did for us what we cannot do for ourselves. So when we come to the communion table, we meet Jesus, our sin, for his forgiveness. That's what happens in the exchange at the communion table. Our rebellion for his obedience, our unrighteousness, for his perfect righteousness. So let's pray this prayer of confession, acknowledging our need for him. And let's pray it with our lips, but mean it from our hearts. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done 
and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, so that we may delight in your will, walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Scripture is clear. It says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I love what it says in verse 17 of our scripture today. He's ready to forgive. He's eager to forgive us. And he has forgiven us. He's accomplished this for us through his finished work on the cross. And because of that finished work, I can happily declare that we are forgiven. And I remind you of what it says in Scripture, that our Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, brothers and sisters, whenever we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would come and consecrate this meal. We see evidence of your movement in our nation this week. We see you moving among college students. It's so clear that you are present there. I pray very simply that you'd be present in this meal as well, this ordinary bread and this unfermented juice and these ordinary people. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Consecrate this meal and sanctify these people. In Jesus' name, amen. In a moment, there will be communion stations up here at the front of the sanctuary. You'll be invited to come to one of those stations where you can take the elements. You can take the bread from the first server and dip it in the cup with the second server. If there's anything on your mind or your heart this morning that you'd like prayer for, even if it's a celebration of something great happening in your life or a concern of something that you want intercession for, you can approach the team of prayers up here in the corner of the sanctuary. They're trained and confidential to take whatever's on your mind and heart right to God in prayer. I invite the servers to come forward at this time.
invite you to stand and sing this with us. Oh, what a Savior. Isn't he wonderful? of Stanwich Church, let us place a hand on someone close by or lay our hands out for a blessing as we sing this song together. Come Holy Spirit.
now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.